takes a little while and a little strange when you make your home out on the range. Start your horse and come along, but you can't get a ride if you can't hold on. Singing, you be tired, yeah, yeah. You be tired, yeah. What? Like the cowboys say. Sing it again now. You be tired, yeah, yeah. Give it on, little dog. Till the break of day Better watch out for those man-eating jackrabbits And that killer cacti Hey, dude This video is brought to you by Patreon Patreon! yippee ki -yay. As Nickelodeon approached its 10th anniversary It was finding itself more and more profitable Meaning it could invest in itself more building upon its foundations and creating more expansive and elaborate original television. 1988 and 1989 was when this really kicked off, with the construction of Nickelodeon Studios, pre-production on their Nicktoons projects, and a number of new shows with higher production values and new genres. This included their first animated co-production with Count Ducula, a high-quality preschool puppet show with Eureka's Castle, and Nick's first sitcom. Oh, the channel had aired imported sitcoms before, usually older shows bleeding over from Nick at Night, you know, shows like Dennis the Menace, Mr. Ed, and The Patty Duke Show. And then there was that one time the channel aired Hanging In for two straight months, which, um, what? In terms of original productions, Nickelodeon had done a few sketch comedy shows like You Can't Do That on Television and Out of Control, but nothing with real episodic storytelling, dimensional characters, or long-form continuity while also trying to be funny. This was new ground for Nickelodeon, but they weren't going to half-ass it. Not only would it get the same amount of pre-production research and test screenings as all their other shows, but it would be filmed largely outdoors far away from the usual production pipelines of California or New York, and would feature live animals with occasional stunt work. With so much being put into it, the success or failure of this show would decide what kind of programs Nickelodeon would make in the future. And so, on July 14th, 1989, the world was introduced to Hey Dude. Tomorrow on Hey Dude. Check out who's checked into the bar none. Everybody knows there's no such thing as... <laughs> it's extraterrestrial trouble. Hey Dude, tomorrow on Nickelodeon. Welcome to the bar none, an Arizona dude ranch with cabins to rent, horses to ride, a lake to paddle around in, a swimming pool, nature hikes, and a delicious barbecue dinner every night. The bar none was recently purchased by Mr. Benjamin Ernst, Mr. E to his friends, played by David Brisbane, a clumsy cowboy cosplayer from New Jersey who has no idea how to run a ranch resort, but after buying it after a combination midlife crisis and messy divorce, well, gosh darn it, he's gonna make this the best dude ranch in the country or die trying. A little dry rot up there. So anyway, I've been making a list here of all the things we need to be taken care of, and uh, I'd like you to make a list too. Loose roof tile. There you go. Along for the ride is his preteen son, Buddy, played by Josh Tajil, and their dog, Cassie. Buddy is a city kid through and through and wants nothing to do with his outdoorsy stuff. He'd rather stay inside, reading comic books. Oh, your mom sent a new batch of comics today, huh? Uh-huh. What's this one about? Well, you see these guys. They're not really guys. They're more like worms from another planet. But they learned English, and they eat mud, and they take over our brains. Well, how do these worms fly spaceships? I mean, they don't have hands, do they? Quantum cell transportation. Oh, I think we learned about that in school. With the bar none comes its staff, consisting mostly of immature teenagers working their summer jobs. The senior staff member is Ted, played by David Lasher a scheming, egotistical young man who always thinks he's the coolest guy in the room, even when he's so clearly not. All right, Bobby, listen. Like I said, it's real easy. You just let it out slow, fast, but steady. And then when your loop is right where you want it, you throw. Ted! 
He shares a cabin with his best friend Danny, played by Joe Torres, a Hopi Indian who alternates between being the voice of reason, the angel on Ted's shoulder, and being a co-conspirator in whatever this week's get-rich-quick scheme might be. Wise guy. Hey, I can't help it if you're the main tourist attraction here. Ooh, you'd hate that, wouldn't you? No, I wouldn't. Then why, when we had that Rename the Ranch contest, you suggested Six Flags over Ted? Yeah, yeah, it did have a certain ring to it, didn't it? But listen, pal, don't let all this attention give you a swelled head, all right? Well, if it does, I'll know just where to go to borrow a hat. Uh, Ted, <laughs> get over here, please. And then in the girls' cabin is Melody, played by Christine Taylor, the local lifeguard who often has to be the mature one in the room, except when it comes to matters of cute boys. So, um, wanna sit here? Sure. And then there's the new writing instructor, Brad, played by Kelly Brown, a rich girl from Michigan who's trying to escape her socialite life for the rough-and-tumble world of the cowgirl. Mark always said you were a little too athletic for his tastes. He needed a more feminine type. You mean a vacuous airhead? I resent that remark. No, Kimberly, you resemble that remark. You know, I could care less that you two got together. I feel great that I'm growing biceps. I'm ecstatic that I'm sweating. In fact, the only thing I'm not delighted about is you and my face. Goodbye! <laughs> Rounding things out is Lucy, played by Deborah Kalman, ranch hand and seemingly the only other adult on the premises. Her no-nonsense attitudes means she's the one everyone turns to for advice, much to her chagrin. I can see what's on your mind. Now you ride that horse, you could fall and break your neck. You even try, and I might break your neck. There's never a dull moment at the Dude Ranch. One day, Mr. Ernst will be trying to promote his new line of tacky, bar none merchandise. The next, Ted and Brad will be handcuffed together, forced to get along. And then the next, a bank robber will crash his escape plane nearby and hold the entire ranch hostage. You were a bank robber. Yeah, but a bank robber with style. Yeah, forget it, you'd never understand. The show would run for five seasons, totaling 65 episodes, supposedly all of it taking place over one summer. Can you imagine going back to school and telling your classmates what you were up to? Yeah, so then Danny faked an injury to get some sympathy from us, and then Melody got scouted by an Olympic swimming coach, and then NASA ran some tests nearby and we thought we were being invaded by aliens, and then, as a promotional gimmick, Mr. Ernst wrestled Captain Lou. Mommy, I, I fell down. I landed on my head, I think. Oh, oh, mommy! I think it's law that every sitcom has to have a professional wrestling episode ever since Laverne and Shirley did it. Hey Dude goes for a kitchen sink approach in terms of fine gets humor, bouncing from cartoony over the top guests to Mr. Ernst caught in some wild slapstick. David Brisbane is pretty great here, to the sitcom staple of characters who are technically best friends but also obviously hate each other and are constantly bickering over inane subjects like, which is better, boys or girls? And you know what? I bet you can't figure out why. Why all the best students at your school are girls? Well, obviously because they study more. Nope, that's not it. What, because they cheat? No. Because home ec counts no. extra? The reason why all the best students at my school are girls is because I go to an all-girls school. Well, that's just stupid, then. No, it's not. And the fact that you couldn't figure it out proves that girls are smarter than guys. It does not. Scientific proof, Ted. It was a stupid riddle. Proves it, proves it, proves it. Women. A lot of it's very silly, but occasionally the humor dips a bit darker than you'd expect. It doesn't show up often, but the show does have a bit of an edge to it from time to time. You know, that's the first incidence of any crime I've ever heard of at the bar none. Uh, except, of course, for those brutal murders. <laughs> but that was many years ago. While hardly a serialized show, Hey Dude did hold to a consistent continuity, and a few big changes in cast happened over the years. Three episodes into season three, Ted received a letter from his school informing him that he didn't earn enough credits and would have to leave for summer school. After a charming date with Brad, that seems to indicate Ted has actually grown a bit. We get a tearful farewell. Ted, come on, let's go. Yeah, I'll be there in a second, Mr. Ernst. Okay, Ted. Come on. 
Well, guys, I hate long goodbyes. So See goodbye. ya. See ya. Bye. Ted. I, I, um, I just wanted to. I'm gonna miss you. Hurry back, okay? In the real world, David Lashier went on to star in the short-lived NBC sitcom A Family for Joe. To fill his place, we're then introduced to Mr. Ernst's nephew, Jake, played by Jonathan Galkin. Jake is an eccentric sort. He's a drummer, he believes in the Loch Ness Monster, and he's got a tendency to dress up for the day's plot. This is going too far. You're right, you're right, let's sit down. That's not what I meant. Danny, how can women walk in these things? It's like you're always going downhill. How's my lipstick? Red. How's mine? I don't think Cherry Delight is your color. And in my opinion, this is when the show was at its best. By replacing Ted's ego with Jake's weirdness, the characters start treating each other nicer and the bickering dies down. It gets a lot less annoying and we can focus more on the goofball shtick. This lasts for nine episodes. At the end of season three, Lucy's on-again, off-again boyfriend shows up and they almost get married. They change their mind, but the boyfriend leaves behind his son, Kyle played by Jeffrey Coy, a young rodeo star with horrifyingly prehistoric women-should-be-in-the-kitchen notions. Oh, well, let's clean up these tables. Yeah, I'm about done. Uh, you guys are finished already? Yeah. Uh, Danny, oh, so shouldn't the girls do this? We'll talk. Hey, can I ask you a question? What? You really wear those clothes? Yes, I wear these clothes. That's why I'm wearing them. But they're so dressy. How can you ride like that? I ride fine, thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Girls shouldn't work on ranches. That's it. I don't care if I lose my job for this. Who do you think you are? Yay! People hate each other again. In season four, there's an episode where Ted runs away from summer school and goes back to the bar nun. He's feeling so lost in the real world. Everything made sense out here in the desert. Why can't he just drop out of school and do this for the rest of his life? It's a really sweet episode, and has Mr. Ernst's finest moment. He may be a total buffoon when it comes to running a dude ranch, and one time he was a cop and that sucked, but his empathy and parenting instincts are spot on. I know what I should do, Mr. Ernst. Okay, forget should for a minute. What do you want to do? I want to stay here. And I also want to move forward. Ted? You could conquer the world. Get out there! Ted, Ted, uh, just a figure of speech. <laughs> I know. You know, you'll always have a place here if you really want. Oh, yeah, sure. That's why Jake is sleeping in my bunk. You say the word, the bunk is yours. Yeah, good. That's what I figured. Sometimes, moving on is sad. Yeah. You know what's even sadder? What? I missed my bus. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think you can put up with this for one night, huh? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and tomorrow is a new life. It's a bittersweet but necessary coda to Ted's character. And then four episodes later, Ted comes back for good. He won the lottery, shrugged off school completely, and is now trying to become co-owners of the Bar Nun. Then the lottery people realize Ted's not 18, take the money back, and Ted has to pay off his debts by returning to his old job. Goodbye character growth, I guess. So you got Ted and his conceited ladies' man persona, and Kyle with his 50s sitcom patriarchy, both vying for Brad's attention. It's about as annoying as you can imagine. What's going on here? You have some problem with me. Yeah, I got, ever since I got back here, I've had a problem with yeah, you. Yeah, well, ever since you came back, I've had a problem with you. Yeah, and I know what the problem is. What's the problem? You want to know what the problem yeah, is? Yeah, what's I the know problem? I know what the problem is. This ranch ain't big enough for the both of us. Did he actually just say that? Yeah, Jake, let them fight. Apparently, they got something to prove. What? Who's stupider? All right. Jake don't care, though. Jake just wants to play his drums all day. Ace King. Hey Dude was the brainchild of Dee LaDuke the receptionist turned co-creator of Nickelodeon's explosive game show success, Double Dare. While the show's other creators like Michael Klinghoffer and Robert Minthal stuck pretty exclusively to the game show side of things, LaDuke wanted to expand into genres Nickelodeon hadn't attempted yet. 
Can you imagine the pitch meeting? Not only should we make our first sitcom, our first narrative show, but we should forgo the usual soundstage and film it all on location in Arizona. For Leduc, it was important that this Hey Dude wasn't a teen drama, despite its teen cast. This was to be a show for younger kids, presenting an idealized setting that you would want to go to, and characters that you would want to grow up to be. When that hormone shift starts happening, that's when you start to dream about separating from your family. Hey Dude being on a dude ranch was a romantic setting that most kids can only dream about, but that would still be a safe setting. Kids that age are just starting to be free to pursue relationships, free to have their first jobs. This was a show for 8-10 to 10 year olds, not the older kids who were on it. It was an aspirational series for kids to think about where they'd be 4 years from now. While Nickelodeon had studio experience and would soon have their own studio space in Florida, on-location shooting was a bit beyond what they were capable of, so production would have to be outsourced. In this case, to Cinetel Productions, a production subsidiary of the advertising firm Bagwell Communications, Cinetel was founded in 1975 and was run by father and son duo, producer Ross Bagwell Sr. and director Ross Bagwell Jr. Based out of Knoxville, Tennessee, Cinetel was already familiar with making country-themed television on the cheap. In 1983, they had produced I-40 Paradise for the Nashville Network one of the first exclusive-to-cable sitcoms ever produced. I-40 Paradise told the story of a former country backup singer, now running a truck stop restaurant between Knoxville and Nashville. It was a thrifty, low-budget production that shot an episode a day, ultimately producing 415 episodes and running for three years. Even at this stage of Nickelodeon's success, that kind of thriftiness and episode turnover was appealing, and in 1988, the network commissioned Cinetel to produce a pilot. The first step was to find a suitable location, and Bagwell Sr. knew just the person to ask. I, had, I called Tucson, Arizona, uh, the operator, and she, she, uh, I asked, I said, can I ask you something? I said, are you from Tucson? And she said, yes. I said, well, you tell me what dude ranch you'd go to if you were in Tucson? And she said, well, I think I'd go to the Tank of Verde. And I said, can you give me that phone number? And she did. And so I told my son Ross to, to stop off in Tucson and go to the Tank of Verde Dude Ranch and see what it looked like. <laughs> the Tank of Verde Guest Ranch was founded in 1928 and stretches out for 640 acres. In November of 1988, Cinetel shot the Hey Dude pilot there. The pilot was never made public, but from what I've been able to piece together, it was filmed at the actual ranch facilities, in contrast to the show proper. Not all of the actors would go onto the main show. The pilot did have Christine Taylor in it, she had originally auditioned for Brad, but it seems the character of Buddy didn't exist yet. It was decided later that a character closer to the show's intended demographic was called for, so open call auditions were held for local Tucson child actors. We're looking for a real 12-year-old, a kid that has homework, Little League. It's very, very important for us to get the kid that's right. We want him to be someone the kids will see as my friend, the kid I see in school. Once the pilot was complete, it was shown to a focus group of 40 kids, and the response was overwhelmingly positive, reportedly the most positive test screening Nickelodeon had ever had up to that point. So a 13-episode first season was ordered, and Cinetel got to work. Filming a full television show at the Tanca Verde Ranch wouldn't be practical for the ranch's business, so several new sets, including the main offices and the bunks for the boys and the girls, were constructed on the outskirts of ranch property. While convincing facades, they weren't functional buildings. The roofs were open to allow for lighting rigs. A horse trailer was converted into a mobile filming base. Episodes took roughly four days to make, with a three weeks on, one week off filming schedule. Cast stayed at nearby hotels, and the underage actors were given on-set tutors. Working with the group was like working with brothers and sisters, because we lived together, we ate together, I mean, we were all so, so close. In that same sense that there were periods of time where some of us couldn't stand each other, and there were periods of time where some of us had crushes on each other, and some of us were um, not speaking to each other. I mean, there's an episode, David, Lasher, and I weren't speaking at this point. 
and um, you know, I who knows why. I mean, we were kids. We might have both liked each other for a little while and then didn't. And so by this point, it was like a non-speaking situation. They did a blooper reel or outtakes or something and, and you see a couple scenes where we're doing it and we're laughing and like hitting each other and then they yell cut and you just see us like walk the other way. But the deer's sharp hoof cut the fox up very badly because the fox doesn't have a hoof like... Can I commit suicide? So there were those, those periods of time and then there were, you know, moments where we got all, all got along great, but it really was like working with your family. Great on set. The biggest advantage in filming the show this way was the texture the natural setting provided everything. You have real windows looking out on real nature instead of some fake plants in a map painting. You get wind blowing the branches around, and kudos to the sound department for keeping the wind noise out of everything. For night scenes, you can see little bugs flying around, attracted to the electric lights. Sitcoms don't look like this. Occasionally, when the sun is low and the sky turns gold, Hey Dude is downright beautiful. The soundtrack was pretty minimal. Sometimes you would get these nice Old West guitars, but mostly you're left with some planking on the Casio keyboard. This was intentional instruction by the Bagwells, who viewed the soundtrack with secondary importance. One day he called me upstairs. He looks at me and says, Is it taking you all day to write the music to two episodes of Hey Dude? I said, Ross, one, I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm new at this. And two, most composers I would imagine get a month for a half hour sitcom, and I'm chucking out two a day. One of the greatest lines ever said to me, just whistle, nobody listens to it anyway. And boy, did that burn into my brain because if you notice the music during a show, you're doing something wrong. Of course, the show's theme is iconic. It's hard not to dip your voice as low as it'll go and go, hey, dude, along with it. The song was composed and performed by Lionel Cartwright, who had been an actor and music coordinator on I-40 Paradise. And we were experimenting with a, uh, there was an effect then that you could lower your voice. So that was me actually going, hey, dude, except it was pitched down <laughs> through an effect, but, uh, yeah, great fun. The show had two rotating directors, the aforementioned Ross Bagwell Jr. and Frederick King Keller, and the two had very different approaches. He took it a lot more seriously, and in a, in a cool way. I mean, I feel like, you know, we probably gave him a hard time, but I think in hindsight now, it was a great experience to see early on when you have a director that cares and who really is invested even if it's just hey dude material, um, he took it seriously and he would really kind of put us to work in, in the sense of like, well, well, what do you think your character, you know, really getting us there. And, and it was almost like an acting exercise. And, and his name was Frederick Keller and he's still working a ton out, out in LA. And, um, and he taught me a lot. And the other director was the, his name his name is Ross Bagwell Jr. because Ross Bagwell Sr. was the head of the production company that ran the whole show and his, he had the total opposite. Who cares? Let's have fun. And um, it was just a, it was like two completely parallel, <laughs> like we were doing the same series but completely different experiences on each of their episodes. On the writing side, you had two story editors. Alan Goodman, who along with Fred Siebert brought the Orange Splat logo to Nickelodeon, and who was the co-creator of Kids Court, and Graham Yost, the first gig for a man who would end up writing the scripts for Speed and Broken Arrow and creating the show Justified. As implied before, there's a certain wavering level of absurdity in the plots and comedy, ranging from very normal plots driven by miscommunication and actual issues you'd find on a dude ranch, like water conservation or dealing with young children, to straight up Toontown stuff. I probably wouldn't have done the episode where Mr. Ernst hits his head 
forgets his adulthood and starts thinking he's a teenager again, and then starts flirting with underage girls. Hi, T-Bone. What's happening, Melody? Where you been all my life? <laughs> well, for most of it, I wasn't born yet. And then there are times when Hey Dude is just a straightforward teen drama, and that's often when it's at its best. Though it does have a few classic special episodes, which it approaches with all the dimension and subtlety of, well, every other sitcom ever. One episode sees Melody's college-aged brother visiting the ranch, and uh-oh, it looks like he's developed quite the drinking problem. We will have to switch rooms, though, Bill, until we can get this one cleaned up. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, buddy, you want to grab the luggage? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, I'll get that. There's also the Christmas episode. Yes, Hey Dude, a show about a desert ranch in the middle of summer, has a Christmas episode. In this one, Brad learns about a neighboring ranch program for disabled children and has to learn not to treat these children as tragedies, but as the human beings they are. These people, they're, they're handicapped. Oh, Brad, wait a second. Brad, Brad, wait. They don't want you to relate to their handicap. They want you to relate to them. And what makes you the expert? Well, I'm not an expert, but I do have a friend back home with cerebral palsy. When I had my broken leg, we used to have wheelchair races. And don't get me wrong, it was no contest. The guy left me in another time zone. I don't know why they make me feel so uncomfortable. Maybe I feel guilty that they have disabilities and I don't. Oh, Brad, don't feel guilty. You have plenty of disabilities. Jake, you know what I mean? Well, of course I do. But other than a little superficial weirdness, say, a spastic move, or maybe even no move at all, they're just like us. However, most serious issue episodes revolved around Danny and matters of his race and culture. First off, it's very cool to see a prominent Native American character as a lead in a sitcom, most of the time just getting to be a kid hanging out with other kids, not being a token minority. It's a bummer that they didn't cast an actual Native American. Joe Torres was Mexican-American, which isn't great, but I guess better than a white guy in red face. These episodes deal with Danny's culture and heritage, including one where he gets insulted when the white occupants of the bar nun try to get him to do a rain dance during a drought, and Danny's like, um, screw you guys? There's a more light-hearted episode where Danny challenges Ted to go a length of time without using anything originating from the Americas and indigenous cultures. You can't touch a slice of pizza unless you make it without tomato sauce. Ready for a nice afternoon snack? Some potato chips or french fries, maybe? No dice, Ted. We grew potatoes first. I'll starve! You, you can't even chew gum. We invented that. And you know what else, Ted? There'd be no Constitution. No United States of America. What? The American forefathers studied Indian government. Like, the whole idea of the United States could be based on the way different Indian tribes govern themselves. Like states do, but they met together to discuss larger issues just like the U.S. Congress. It's true, Ted, every word of it. Wait a second, I, I don't understand something here. How come we never read about this in the history books or see it in movies or anything? Who writes the history books, Ted? Who makes the movies? Not too many Indians. <sighs> I feel like a complete jerk, Danny. My personal favorite Danny episode, however, is season four, episode nine, Do the Right Thing where an archaeologist discovers an Indian burial ground on the property, and Danny is wrecked when these remains are treated not just as a white man's game of finders keepers, but as a tourist attraction for the ranch. It's not right for Fenton, or anyone for that matter, to go around digging up people. My people. Danny, you make it sound like archaeology is a bad thing. It's, it's not. It's, it's how we learn about ourselves, how far we've come. Yeah, Danny, it's, it's like another part of history that we can learn about. You want history? Fine, let's go around and dig up Benjamin Franklin or General Custer. You think that's ethical? No state would ever issue a permit for that. Come on, Dan, that's different. No, it's not. Okay, Mr. E, what if somebody wanted to go dig up your Aunt Martha at, at Forest Lawn? How would that make you feel? A Aunt Martha? My Aunt Martha? She baked the best mulberry pie in, in Bergen County. I don't think I'd like that at all. And you'd defend her rights no matter what? Oh, yeah, I, I guess I would. It's rare to see a TV show go, you know, sometimes archaeology is just theft. 
The people behind the show definitely had their heart in the right place when it came to Danny. And I think it's a sign of things to come in terms of Nickelodeon's relationship with different racial demographics into the 1990s. Hey Dude made his premiere on Nickelodeon on July 14, 1989, and while it technically had five seasons, the seasons were so close together as to be an effectively meaningless term. For example, the last episode of season one aired on October 6, 1989, and the first episode of season two aired just a week later on October 13th. Production never really stopped or slowed down for its 65 episodes. The final new episode of Hey Dude aired on August 30th, 1991, with no formal finale. The show would have been easily sustainable if it had been willing to embrace long-term change. Yes, the teen actors would grow out of the roles, but the Dude Ranch setting meant you could have a constantly rotating cast of young people, start a new summer every other season or so. As it was, Hey Dude collected so many cast members that, by the last season, someone was being excluded from pretty much every episode. But even if it was more flexible, with the sheer amount of productions Nickelodeon kicked off in the first half of the 1990s, Hey Dude would have to have been a mega success for the channel to keep it in production. By all accounts, the show was popular, but it wasn't blockbuster huge, and it didn't have the merchandising potential as many of the other shows coming down the pipeline. And 65 episodes? Well, that'll keep it in reruns for a while. David Lasher went on to have a very busy 90s, with reoccurring roles in Beverly Hills 90210, Blossom, Clueless, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Christine Taylor went on to play Marsha Brady in the Brady Bunch movie and its sequel, had reoccurring roles in Curb Your Enthusiasm and Arrested Development, and appeared in a number of films alongside her husband, Ben Stiller, including Zoolander, Dodgeball, and Tropic Thunder. David Brisbane and Debbie Kalman are still acting today, but most everyone else in the cast went on to do other things. Kelly Brown went into business, Josh Tajil went into private investigation, Jeffrey Coy went into marketing, and Jonathan Galkin went on to found the indie label DFA Records. As for Joe Torres, well, he's become something of an internet unsolved mystery. He left acting after Hey Dude and didn't keep in touch with the cast and crew and nobody's been able to track him down for various cast reunions or interviews. There have been rumors about his whereabouts, his occupation, and whether or not he's even still alive, but nothing substantial has been put forth. Nickelodeon continued to rerun Hey Dude for pretty much all of the 90s, airing its last on January 23rd, 1999, and it had a pretty prominent time slot during all of that. It never left the afternoon, it was not one of those shows that slowly creeped into the early AM hours. Despite it being an 80s show, Hey Dude is remembered more as a 90s show, often included in the various books and documentaries that focus on the quote-unquote golden age of the channel, aka the 1990s. Does it deserve that distinction? Hey Dude is a mixed bag down to its DNA. It was an ambitious idea that would take a lot of effort to pull off, given to a production company known for doing things cheap and fast. One of the directors was a high-quality professional, the other was the result of nepotism who wasn't taking it all too seriously. Some of the acting is great, some of the acting is pretty stiff. Some of the scripts are grounded and some are outlandish. Hey Dude's biggest flaw is inconsistency. But at the same time, it did prove that original sitcoms were a viable genre for Nickelodeon, and kicked off what is still a major staple for the channel. There are trends in these sitcoms started with Hey Dude, particularly the goofy grown-up that you can't take seriously. You can run a direct line from Mr. Ernst to, say, Mr. Sikowitz on Victorious. Nickelodeon liked the outdoor camp adventure idea so much that they basically did it again a few years later with Salute Your Shorts. Hey Dude is an important show, and every once in a while, it's a really good show. And it's been well preserved. The entire series has been available on DVD since 2013, and in fact finding a complete set at a pawn shop several years ago was one of the things that inspired me to create Knickknacks. I wanted to explore this show and the context surrounding it. At the time of this writing, the entire series is also available through iTunes, Amazon Prime, and Paramount+. Plus. Multiple cast reunions have kept the show in the nostalgic consciousness, and the sets out in Arizona are still standing somewhat, making it a travel destination for classic Nickelodeon fans. Hey Dude marked the shift from 80s Nickelodeon, with the cheap productions and the reliance on outside influences, 
to 1990s Nickelodeon, the era of the creative do-it-yourself spirit. And for that reason, this is the show I've decided to end the 1980s on. You may have noticed that Knickknacks doesn't work with a true chronology. Things are ordered by year, but the shows within that year will get shuffled to help with pacing and what I feel is the most interesting order to talk about things. Eureka's Castle, Fred Penner's Place, and Make the Grade all premiered afterwards, but Hey Dude was the true finale of 1980s Nickelodeon. Here's the future it'll bring. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Next time. Before we start the 1990s, let's take one last look back at Nickelodeon's first decade of operation. We'll fix some mistakes I made, cover a few topics I skipped, and show off some long-lost footage. Today's research shout-out goes to the documentary Television Pioneer, the story of Ross K. Bagwell Sr., which covered the man and the company that would eventually make Hey Dude. The documentary is a bit of a self-congratulatory backpack for, honestly, a company that made some very cheap trash television. But if you like exploring obscure corners of TV history, it's definitely worth a watch. It's free on the PBS website. Link in description below. Thank you all for watching. If you'd like to support Knickknacks and other Paparina projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to research materials, production values, and these lovely rice crackers I've been getting into. Very light, very crunchy. You can also support the channel by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, hitting that bell icon for notifications, following me on Twitter, sending a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, and sharing knickknacks with all your friends. I'll see you next time, and as always, Black Lives Matter. Thank you.